Behold, this child is set for the fall and for the resurrection of many in Israel, and for a sign that shall be contradicted. And thy own soul a sword shall pierce, that out of many hearts thoughts may be revealed. Today we contemplate the first sorrow of Our Lady, the presentation of the child into the temple, and the prophecy of Simeon. When we look at sorrow, we see that it is a special kind of pain. For we know that pain is, is sensed at the presence of something which is uh, some evil which is present. And we, we know whenever we say pain, we associate it with physical pain, uh, a knife wound or a, or a pick of a print. We see that there is a certain pain associated with it, but that's physical pain. This sorrow is a special kind of pain because it is internal. St. Thomas says the object and motive of sorrow is anything hurtful or evil interiorly, apprehended by the reason or the imagination. So if it comes to our imagination or we think through it, we reason through it, then we can see that there is a pain that comes to our soul. Now, th- two things are necessary for any kind of pain, including sorrow. And these are, first of all, St. Thomas is being conjoined. So the sorrow being actually present with some, uh, so, uh, being conjoined with that evil, that sorrow. And then the second thing is the perception of that conjunction, that knowing, whether it be the perception that we feel through our senses or that through our imagination or reason. So these two things are necessary. First of all, the present evil, and, the, and then finally the perception of being conjoined to that evil. Well, we consider the amount of sorrow in Our Lady then. First of all, we consider how it was conjoined. That we note that Our Lady was so united to Our Lord. So often we see the two hearts of Our Lord and Our Lady together, side by side, and one sword piercing through them, as if they were one heart. St. Antoninus says these words, While other martyrs suffered by sacrificing their own lives, the Blessed Virgin suffered by sacrificing her son's life, a life that she loved far more than her own, so that she not only suffered in her soul all that her son endured in his body, but moreover the sight of her son's torments brought more grief to her heart than if she had endured them all in her own person, St. Antoninus. Consider these points when we consider the suffering of Our Lady. First of all, how much she loved our Lord. Naturally speaking, this was her only son. And the love that a mother has for her only son is poured out on that one son. Then we consider also the natural, a natural mother how much she would love a son who was perfect to her, who loved her in all ways and was obedient in all things, who always did what was right and always did what was correct and most fitting and at the same time loved his mother with great affection. Imagine the natural love that some mother would have for that son. Then we consider all that she suffered with that son. We note that in wartime, when soldiers are out fighting together and they come back from great battles that they endured, it bonds them even closer than anything. And all the sufferings that our lady endured with her son, our Lord Jesus Christ, we see that that bonded her very strongly to him. But we should go beyond this. For remember that that her son was not simply a natural-born son. He was also her God. And she loved God above all things. She loved Him with that perfect love of the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady. And so we can see here also how perfectly she loved Him. But we can also note when we consider the great sorrow that would be in Our Lady's heart, that when she turns to God, when she's beholding the sorrows, she is not consoled, but rather her sorrows are increased. 
For us, when we have sorrows, we turn to our Lord, we have an image of our Lord, and we'll turn to Him, and we'll ask Him for assistance. Or we go to Him in the Blessed Sacrament, and we receive consolations at that time. But Our Lady did not have these consolations. Rather, when she turned to Him during the sorrows, her sorrows increased all the more. There was the object of her sorrows, being crucified by men who hated him. She loved him immensely, and here he is being treated with such contempt. So the very source of her consolation also brings her those sorrows. So then we consider the conjunction of Our Lady with her son. But then also we should consider the perception of this union, which would have also been a cause of that sorrow, the perception of the union. For Our Lady perceived nothing greater than her son in his love for us. She noted from the very moment of his birth how much God loved us, that he came down and became a little baby and endured so much in that crib in Bethlehem and throughout her entire, his entire life and how much he endured from men throughout his public ministry. Then also she realized how perfectly he loved compared to the reception that he received from mankind, being despised by men, being mocked, belittled, and treated with great contempt to the very end, even to the point of being crucified and being betrayed by those whom he loved. So we consider then how much would have been her sorrow because of the perception of the pain that was involved here. The, an angel said to St. Bridget, the Blessed Virgin suffered even before she became his mother, knowing the incarnate word was to suffer for, for men. Excuse me. The, and compassionating this innocent Savior who was to be so cruelly put to death for the crimes not his own. We also see that St. Alphonsus says, there can be no doubt that enlightened by the Holy Ghost in a far higher degree than all the prophets, she far better than they understood the predictions recorded by them in the sacred scriptures concerning the Messiah. She knew how these would be fulfilled. And so she suffered even before they came about, suffering in her soul. She also suffered greatly in the, in the great amount that she suffered. For St. Anselm says, Had not God, by a special miracle, preserved the life of Mary in each moment of her life, her grief was such that it would have caused her death. And St. Bernardine of Siena said, The grief of Mary was so great that were it divided amongst all men, it would, not, it would suffice to cause their immediate death. The things that she contemplated especially was the torments that he would endure. For St. Alphonsus says, Her grief was immeasurably increased when she became the mother of the Savior, so that the sad sight of so many torments which were to be endured by her poor son, she indeed suffered a long martyrdom, a martyrdom which lasted her whole life. And so today we consider that first sorrow of Our Lady. Well, when we think that, and we realize that sorrow or pain is brought about by being conjoined to that, that evil, or the, and then having that perception of that, that conjunction, why is it that when we consider something which we should be sorrowful for, why don't we have that same sorrow in our souls? Why are we not sorry as well? Why do we not join and have that compassion, that same compassion that St. John or Mary Magdalene had at the foot of the cross? It's important that we have that compassion on Our Lady. It's important how we react to the pains of our Lord and the sorrows of Our Lady. And thy Thy own soul a sword shall pierce, 
that out of many hearts, thoughts might be revealed. First of all, we're not truly united because we don't think about it enough. So our intellect is not united. We don't meditate upon our lady's sufferings as we should. So we're not conjoined to that sorrow. And too often we don't perceive this union because our wills are not aligned as well. We don't love Our Lady to be sufficiently united as she suffered. St. Albert the Great says that as we are under great obligations to Jesus for his passion, endured for our love, so also are we under great obligations to Mary for the martyrdom which she voluntarily suffered for our salvation in the death of her son. St. Agnes said to St. Bridget in a vision, Our compassionate and benign mother was satisfied rather to endure any torments than that our souls that our souls should not be redeemed. And so she suffered these for us, the pains of childbirth of her other children, her spiritual children. So what are the seven sorrows that we might be able to meditate on? The seven sorrows are these. First, the three of them in, uh, concern the sorrows of Our Lady in, in, while Our Lord was yet a child. St. Simeon, Simeon, the prophecy of St. Simeon. All those prophecies brought to light of the sufferings of Our Lord. Then there's the flight from Egypt when Herod was seeking not to worship God, but to kill him. The third is the loss of the child Jesus in the temple. We consider how for those three days, not knowing where he was, she suffered greatly in her soul. And then the fourth, the fourth through the seventh, are those related to the passion. The meeting of Mary and Jesus on the way to Calvary. That sorrowful meeting of those two hearts that loved each other so much. Then the crucifixion and death of our Lord, having to endure to see her Lord suffer so much. And then the sixth is the piercing of the side of our Lord Jesus Christ and his descent from the cross. And the last one is the burial of Jesus. These are depicted right here on each one of the windows, the seven sorrows of Our Lady. So we can think about them every time we come into Mass. And Our Lady promises for those who meditate upon the sorrows of her sorrows. She promises great things. We can go through them all, but we can, we'll just consider one or two at, the, at this moment. All the, the, the promises that she will give for us. She says, for example, I will defend them in their spiritual battles with the infernal enemy. I will protect them at every instant of their lives. What an incredible promise from Our Lady. This because she endured so much, especially we consider the meeting of Christ on Calvary. She wasn't being able to be there for her son to assist him as she wanted to help him carry the cross physically. But morally, she gave him everything that she could, her prayers and her support. And so she too, for us, has won for us a great grace. I will visibly help them at the moment of their death. They will see the face of their mother. What an incredible promise from a mother whose son could not see her face because of the blood and the sweat that was pouring into his eyes. She promises to help us out at the moment of our death. And there are seven seven promises total given. So how can we ourselves be united to Our Lady's sorrows if we want to foster this devotion in our hearts? How can we do this? Well, we can do it really well through, our, through a, a, a meditation. And we'll just go through a real quick meditation right now, how we can meditate upon the sorrows of Our Lady. First of all, we ask for the grace that we are seeking. The, the grace is this, to have a greater compassion for Our Lady's sorrows so we be, be able to understand it more fully. We place ourselves in the presence of God and we ask that all of our thoughts be directed to His honor, praise, and glory. And then we use our imaginations. We use our senses. We see what's going on. And we'll contemplate the first sorrow. We contemplate Our Lady carrying the child Jesus 
into the temple for the first time. A fulfillment of the great prophecy of Agaius, that this Messiah will enter into this temple. We consider this. And then we see how humbly they approach. We also look around and see what other men are doing, how they neglect this great act that is going on because they are so concerned with the things of the world. Then we can turn to ourselves and think, what about me? Am I so concerned with the things of the world that I forget to take heed of those more important things of the spiritual life? Am I always watching television, the computer? Am I so concerned with the things of the world that I forget my most important end? The next point we can consider then is what we hear, the words of the men. We see Anna and Simeon praying, expecting their Lord, just hoping for Him. And we see so many other people doing other things, business even in the temple, buying and selling. And they are not concerned with the higher things. Then we can see the great love that they had. That could be a second point that we consider. The love of Our Lady and St. Joseph in offering their Son, the only begotten of the Father, the great love that Simeon had in taking the child into his hands and Anna in announcing his coming. And we can see how men would despise this, would look upon these humble servants carrying two pigeons. They didn't even have enough to buy a lamb. They had to go with the poor person's offering of two pigeons. And we can see how the world despises the things of God, which are far greater than the things of the world. But the world looks at the cost of things physically. Cornelius Lapide says, The scribes and the Pharisees, who, like the heretics of today, appear to be upholders of justice and truth, may show that the world how antagonistic they are to the true Messiah and to justice and to the evil designs they cherish against him. For before the advent of Christ, they were in hopes that he would come with pomp and wealth, even as Solomon, so that they might be raised by him in honor and riches. But when they saw him in his humility and poverty, opposing himself to their ambition and avarice, and publicly rebuking them for it, they set him as not and opposed him, secretly scheming and bringing him to the destruction which they at length actually compassed. That the thoughts of men might be revealed. So we can think about our thoughts. Are they set on high things in the world? Or are they set on high things in the eyes of God? And then we can thank our Lord for this great opportunity of thinking of those sorrows. And then ask Our Lady to help us to draw us closer to her Son at this time of Christmas. That we may understand the great sacrifice that he has done for us. And that we also may be able to understand the great sacrifice of Our Lady for each and every one of us in her seven sorrows. Thy own soul a sword shall pierce, that out of many hearts thoughts may be revealed.